We have with us today uh, one of the most recognized, articulate, and authoritative voices of the government of the United Arab Emirates, Dr. Anwar Gargash. Uh, Dr. Gargash received uh, not one but two degrees from the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. in political science, and then completed a PhD at King's College, Cambridge. He went on to teach political science in the Emirates, uh, but has had a distinguished public career as well. Um, there are many highlights, but only two I will mention. In 2006, he was named the head of the National Elections Commission Committee and supervised the first elections in the UAE. And in, nine, in 2008, he was named Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, a position that he still occupies. And in that position, he has become one of the principal spokespersons for the Emirates and one of the principal guiders of the foreign policy of, of the Emirates. Um, and following his remarks, we will have a short period for questions and answers from uh, the audience. So as we have done this morning, please log on, submit your questions, and we will then pose them to Dr. Anwar. So Dr. Anwar, I give you the floor. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, I was just one, you know, listening to the universities that I went to, and I remember that it was all in the past century. <laughs> uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, I'm delighted to be addressing this prestigious forum today. Let me start by congratulating the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, D.C., for gathering this leading group of officials and distinguished experts on the Horn of Africa, a region which covers a geographical area of strategic, economic, and social importance for the UAE, the Gulf region, and indeed the international community. Uh, the current global order is one that is becoming increasingly turbulent, and its future trajectory remains uncertain. The direction of the international system in the years ahead is a cause for tense deliberations among the world's leaders in many capitals around the world. Indeed, some actors are trending in a zero-sum game driven by great power competition. And as we reassess how we view the very nature of the global system, a diverse range of non-traditional actors are increasingly gaining ascendancy, often at the expense of states. All the while, anti-establishment and populist sentiments are on the rise. And there is a multiplication of conflicts, particularly in our part of the world, that are increasingly becoming interlinked. Although these challenges uh, appear daunting, I would not characterize the current global order as one that is in a state of chaos. Rather, that the present global order we are witnessing is one that is experiencing profound transformation and evolution. Ladies and gentlemen, for the Middle East, a region that has and continues to undergo intense transformation, driven by instability and power vacuums, these new dynamics provide an opportunity for regional states to reassess their strategic interests at the international level in the years and decades to come. The Horn of Africa, another region that has undergone intense transformation recently, has had an exceptional year, a year that has seen unprecedented transitions that have the potential to transform one of the most conflict-prone regions in the world into, we hope, a new region of cooperation and prosperity. One of the countries that's going through such a transformation is Sudan. The UAE, along with other international partners, supported Sudan's efforts to reach an agreement that lays the foundation uh, of an organized political transition. Sudan now has an exceptional opportunity to turn this transition into a sustainable success model that could become a blueprint for other countries in the region. Sudan's political transformation comes at a time when neighboring Ethiopia also finds itself at a moment of profound change. Last year, as part of, this, of its peaceful transition, Ethiopia 
signed a historic peace accord with Eritrea, in which the UAE played a role in its fruition through bringing both countries together. Sudan's and Ethiopia's recent achievements demonstrate that we ought to be more ambitious in finding new ways to lend support to diplomatic processes and initiatives that promise to deliver hope. Ladies and gentlemen, the people of the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula have shared culture, trade, and social relations for millennia. Since the formation of the UAE, our engagement with the Horn of Africa has gradually grown, and over the past decade, so has our support to most of the countries in the region. Today, the goal of achieving regional peace and stability and economic prosperity drives our relations with the countries of the Horn of Africa. Please allow me to elaborate on this further. First, the UAE's long-term commitment to the Horn of Africa is deeply rooted in the region's history and geostrategic significance as part of the Arabian Peninsula's immediate neighborhood. It is in this region that Islam and Christianity encountered one another and peacefully coexisted for centuries, exemplifying the principles of religious pluralism, tolerance, and peace that remain deeply embedded in the UAE's society today. This region is also vital in ensuring freedom of navigation throughout the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. This assumes an even more significant dimension uh, in light of the unprecedented maritime provocations in the Arabian Gulf and the Bab el-Mandeb Strait, through which between 7 and 10 percent of global maritime trade passes. Secondly, the UAE believes that the stabilization of the Horn of Africa should be viewed through a framework for securing economic investment and trade opportunities in the Horn and the wider region, instead of focusing on security challenges alone. In this context, the Horn of Africa, together with Eastern Africa, should be seen as part of the greater Indian Ocean economy, with its massive trade and economic potential. For the Arabian Peninsula and the countries of the Gulf, the more their economies diversify in the years and decades ahead, the more interdependent the Arabian Peninsula will be on trade and investments throughout the growing African market. In this context, strengthening infrastructure and transportation networks and supporting economic cooperation between the countries of the Horn uh, of Africa, in addition to the development of the region's economic sectors, such as oil and gas, hydropower and ports, will contribute decisively to the financial sustainability of the Horn of Africa. Thirdly, the Horn of Africa and the Arabian Peninsula uh, share most of the security threats centered in and around the Red Sea, laying the Bab el-Mandeb Strait and the Gulf of Eden. Over the past decade, the UAE has played various constructive roles in the Horn of Africa and continues to be a strong supporter of international efforts to return peace and stability to the region through humanitarian development as well as security efforts. The UAE also, the UAE also played a leading role in, their, in undermining the threat of a Shabab terror organization. And as part of our efforts to protect the freedom of maritime navigation in the region over the past years, the UAE has played a pivotal role in combating piracy of the coast of Somalia and supported inter-Somali dialogue to bring peace and security to that country. The central role played by us in combating Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, in the south of Yemen, liberating Aden, and many southern provinces as part of the Arab coalition should not be solely seen as counterterrorism efforts targeting AQAP. These efforts are also integral to targeting and eradicating AQAP supply lines to al-Shabaab uh, in Somalia. In this context, I would like to point out to the fact that three decades of Islamist rule in Sudan should serve as a compelling reminder of the true nature of political Islam when in power, serving as a sanctuary for the Brotherhood and other radical movements across Africa and the Middle East, 
and stifling social and economic growth for many decades. Ladies and gentlemen, as I have highlighted earlier in my address, the current global order is one that is fluid and is moving towards a multipolar system whose ultimate direction remains uncertain. Unfortunately, this has meant that very often, particularly in the past few years, the Horn of Africa has not received the kind of vigorous international leadership and support that such a fragile and complex region needs. Nevertheless, there is a new momentum in the region, and we should collectively seize this opportunity to formulate sustainable solutions that serve the interests of regional states and meet the aspirations of the people. In this regard, I would like to propose that we focus on the following five areas. Firstly, strengthening the regional multilateral system that can support the ongoing uh, transitions, preserve stability and resolve disputes and conflict. Wider regional integration is one of the most effective approaches to addressing the socio-economic challenges that deeply impact many areas in the Horn of Africa. This goes hand in hand with the need for international partners to cooperate rather than compete in this region through collective efforts that focus on stability, security, and economic solutions. In this context, the UAE looks favorably to Saudi Arabia's plans to create a Red Sea grouping. And we believe that such models will ultimately play an important role in supporting stability and development in the Horn of Africa. Secondly, empowering regional organizations to play a greater role in achieving regional security and stability and addressing underlying tensions and disputes. It must be stressed here that regional organizations are best positioned to develop effective solutions to the issues of their member states. In this regard, the international community can take inspiration from the outstanding role of the EU, as well as Ethiopia, in mediating between Sudan's military council and the opposition groups, as well as the, its role in many peace and security efforts across the African continent. Thirdly, improving regional and state-level governance in parallel with building accountable and transparent political and economic sanctions. Facing a growing number of regional as well as global challenges, no country can manage them on their own or stay immune. Guided by our leadership's vision of good governance and strong, credible institu institutions, the UAE is actively engaged in supporting reform and good governance across many countries in the Horn uh, and the African continent. Fourthly, in parallel with international counterterrorism efforts, there must be a greater international collabor collaboration to curb states from funding and supporting security and extremist or organized, terrorist and extremist organizations in the Horn of Africa. This must be an absolute zero tolerant commitment from the international community to combat AQAP and the threat of Daesh in the region and beyond. This demands coordinated and global action at every level, but also support for the Horn of, African, of Africa states to provide services amongst the poorest and most marginalized, which is key to tackle trans transnational extremist ideologies. Finally, the search for regional and multilateral appropriate architectures should not distract us from the immediate priorities in the Horn of Africa. In this regard, the region needs our concerted support to relaunch growth and investment while tackling reforms and underdevelopment. If the transitions in Sudan and Ethiopia are not managed and supported, the promising transformations that are taking place in the region could be reversed, which will pose great risks for the wider peace and stability. The time has therefore come to reinvigorate our efforts and jointly support the Horn of Africa to turn the page into an era of regional cooperation, which will enable it to unleash its uh, full economic potential. Thank you very much.
First of all, thank you very much You're for welcome. giving us uh, a very clear strategic overview of the thoughts thank of the, the Emirates on this very crucial region. Um, and reminding me that I also was at George Washington and did a master's degree on Soviet politics. So okay. This was very much in the previous okay. century. Um, before I take some of the questions from the audience, I wanted to start with something you said in the middle of your remarks, talking about the growing multipolarity of the world, uh, great power competition. How do you see multipolarity and the different uh, government and non-governmental actors affecting Emirati and Gulf policy with regard to the Horn of Africa? Well, for, for me, I think uh, in addressing any region today, for me, a starting point is how does the international system look? Because you don't really work in a void. If the international system was actually as secure and rigid as it was uh, prior to the breakup of the Soviet Union, your minds towards regions, etc., will be more fixed in many ways. What I'm really, uh, and, and I don't think this is only something that I would mention the Horn, but I think this is something that I see as an appropriate preamble with regards to discussion of any region currently. We are as states that are medium sized such as the UAE, very cognizant that this is a very fluid, uh, world, it's not chaotic, but it clearly is not as rigid and regimented as it was. And I think we need always to start from that point. And I think this is why sometimes uh, countries the size of the UAE are taking certain responsibilities that they wouldn't have taken in a different world, because they understand that the impact on their own region is going to be quite decisive. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, you understand that it's a conundrum. In many ways, if you act, there are challenges. And if you don't act, there are repercussions. So for me, I think this is an extremely, extremely important uh, you know, sort of framework when we discuss these. I, I mean, definitely, it, it, it sort of colors our view when we look at issues. You can't come as a Gulf country uh, of a medium size, uh, such as the UAE, very large economy, but perhaps much smaller population, and say, I will come back and revert to what a traditional Gulf country, uh, you know, the way it acted, for example, because the problem is a different world, to be honest. So for me, that is an extremely, extremely important framework as we address things. I think it is an extremely important reason why we act the way we act. And sometimes we take perhaps risks that are larger than, uh, than we ought to take in many ways. But unfortunately, in vacuums that we see, you can see that you either have uh, short-term pain or long strategic uh, you know, concerns and deficits. So for me, that's very important. Thank you. Um, there was a lot of discussion this morning at our sessions about the engagement of countries from outside of Africa in the Horn, and particular emphasis on China. And one of the questions from the audience is um, asking you, what parallels are there, if any, between the styles of engagement of China and the Gulf states with the Horn of Africa? And to what extent do you do you believe to be competing, and to what extent are you able to work together? No, I think I think China uh, is, uh, you know, and again, I I mean, China is a reality in the new international system. And to be honest, nobody has yet the answer on what will be the role of China uh, in the next decade. For example, at least I'm talking from our region. China is much more assertive within its own. Uh, let's say, far eastern uh, dimension and within, within its own immediate neighborhood. It's less assertive in our region, but definitely in Africa and the Horn, it has major, major interest. There are, China is now the number one trading partner for more countries than the United States. Mm. So clearly you can see the strength of uh, China's economy and its willingness to push forward. Now here, 
I think uh, experts who know much more about China are divided uh, about the future trajectory of how China will work in the global system. Some see it more as a classic superpower model. So China, under this model, will actually do what the United States did or the Soviet Union in its heyday. So it will actually play more of a, a classic superpower. Others argue not. Others argue that China will be influential, but does not necessarily want to play the role of a classic superpower. Again, within the horn, uh, we, uh, I mean, I would, I would say that uh, for us to claim that we are, uh, we are competitors for China, I think will be, uh, will be, you know, uh, will be bragging, to be honest. I mean, China has a huge economy, deep pockets, uh, and is, has the capability of actually uh, playing a very important role in many, many countries. And clearly, its model on Africa as markets, raw material, uh, lending and so on and so forth is not something to be compared with what we have. I think what we need to do is find more areas of international cooperation because as I mentioned, the, the problem that you have right now, this is a very, I think, uh, confusing international system to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be perhaps clearer or not in 10 years' time. But clearly everything that we see right now tells us we have to find areas of cooperation. And these areas of cooperation should be areas with fundamentally, fundamentally two uh, uh, guidelines, uh, stability and, uh, and, 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 and basically prosperity or, or development. And I think these are the two areas that we need to. Have. There are, of course, instances where you might have, you know, uh, certain competition. Uh, you know, Djibouti is an area over the port, but I wouldn't really describe this as an outright competition between the Gulf and China. Mm. I don't think that uh, you know, that, that, that uh, this is quite an accurate, uh, you know, sort of prescription here. But I think right now uh, our interest is that there is an impact from this region on us. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it is in our interest that this region is st stable. And on the other hand, we look at our model. I mean, again, many people, uh, are uh, sometimes puzzled by the UAE's search for ports, for example. And I say it's, uh, don't be puzzled because this is really in the DNA of the UAE's success. I mean, the UAE's success has not been because it's an oil producer. That is a major part of it, but there are so many other oil producers. But one of the main, uh, areas or, or, or components of our success has been to be what I would call, say a logistical business hub. And that involves airlines and free zones and ports and things like that. And I think this is why we have this sort of you know, keenness to, uh, to, to have markets that we are part and parcel of the growth of the, those markets. Whether we are uh, the transition to that market or whether we have a market share, whether we are a supplier or a conduit. So I think this is more or less also part of what we're saying. If you'll permit me, based on the questions we're getting from the audience, I'd like to briefly go through three important countries in the Horn, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Somalia, and get your, your thoughts. Um, for Ethiopia, uh, the election of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed significantly changed the dynamic, made the peace process in which the Emirates was yeah. intimately involved possible. Do you see uh, the Prime Minister as representative of a new technocratic uh, model of governance uh, of, of a younger generation? Mm -hmm. And how do you, how have you been able to deal with uh, well, again, the new dynamics? Uh, again, in again, I think our, our view of Ethiopia is very much in line with the general optim optimistic view mm -hmm. with concerns also that Ethiopia should succeed. Mm -hmm. 
Ethiopia is a major, major uh, country in Eastern Africa, in our region, and I think that nobody can afford uh, that Ethiopia fails. And I think the Prime Minister, through his style, through his openness, is also brought uh, a breath of fresh air. But clearly, there is also a precarious challenge for all three countries, really. Mm -hmm. And I think that success is very important. I think vis-a-vis -vis Sudan, again, uh, you know, many people uh, try to sort of categorize the UAE's, uh, you know, uh, efforts in Sudan as an effort, uh, you know, designed to, uh, to maintain status quo, uh, be anti uh, the popular uh, feelings of Sudan, etc. But I think we have, uh, for any um, neutral and objective observer, we have played a very credible and uh, important role in uh, ensuring what was really our concern, yeah. which was really uh, transiting from uh, a field uh, political Islamist state to a new uh, uh, Sudan, a more hopeful Sudan. We're still not there because it's still a transition and the challenges are very big. And I think also we are part of uh, a grouping that wants to help Sudan. So we're not really working alone there. You know, but for us, it's always the same thing. We actually uh, have seen what 10 years of the Arab so-called Arab Spring is brought to the region. And we've seen that the cost has been very high. And clearly our view has always been uh, about transitioning successfully and about transitioning with stability. I think for us, these are important because it impacts us, to be honest. I mean, again, you look at uh, various Arab countries and, and, and you have an impact, economic, mm -hmm. Uh, humanitarian, uh, political, and I think this is something we wanted to avoid for Sudan. Sudan is, uh, change is encouraging, but again, uh, it is precarious, and we have to help Sudan. We have to be there for Sudan. We have to ensure that this three-year transition, which is quite a long period of change, is successful, and we have to recognize that 30 years of mismanagement has left really a plethora of, uh, of uh, problems that Sudan is, failing, is, uh, is facing. And you need to sort of deconstruct these problems. There is no magical wand uh, to sort of uh, you know, resolve these issues. And with regard to Somalia, one of the issues that has been raised is the tension between the central government and uh, the autonomous uh, parts of, uh, of Somalia. Uh, what is the view of the Emirates on how this can be remedied, how, how the government can be strengthened and brings uh, Somalia out of the problems it has solved and it face uh, Again, again, I think, I think uh, you know, I mean, I don't, uh, you know, divulge anything new when I say that, you know, we, uh, we feel that our role in Somalia, uh, you know, uh, has not really been uh, appreciated by the current government. Mm. You know, our role in Somalia uh, was when we were the only Arab country really involved in Somalia. And what started mainly, mainly as, uh, and you know, I, you know I've, I've gone through this actually, it started mainly in, 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 the, in the realm of anti-extremism and anti-terrorism. Mm -hmm. And these were, those were very difficult times mm -hmm. where Somalia had very few committed friends and we were one of those committed friends. And that role sort of, you know, developed because then when uh, the issue of piracy came, we were one of the earliest countries to sort of raise awareness and play a role with many other of our European and international friends in uh, constructing uh, together or structuring together a response. 
uh, we uh, we organized here several investment forums to support Somalia. Uh, we tried to help with areas such as uh, fishery and, and, and cattle also, because these were the two sort of early wins uh, for, for Somalia. But I think, I think uh, again, Somalia uh, be became polarized, I think, in the same polarization that we saw, unfortunately, in the Arab world. We're still hopeful that you know our role has receded. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, you know mediators who are trying to ask us to come back to Somalia, but I think we we feel that the time is not right because after all the effort that we have put there, uh, that these efforts were undermined. And uh, I don't think this is the right time for us. We're hoping, of course, uh, that uh, Somalia also uh, will uh, manage itself better. We hear good news on what they are doing in terms of on the monetary side. We are still concerned at, uh, uh, at, at uh, the sort of continuous threat by extremism uh, in in Somalia, and is, of course, you know they have a big debate now about center and 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 periphery. But I think the main argument here is also very much linked with Ethiopia in many ways. You know, we feel that a country the size of Ethiopia uh, has to be served by many ports. You know, you can't actually have. Uh, you know, a land-based population the size of Ethiopia dependent on one or two ports. I mean, if you look anywhere in the world, a population that size, uh, size can be served by seven, eight ports, and this is normal. So I think the, also the idea of trying to, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to accept that there is one gateway to Ethiopia or one or two gateways to Ethiopia is actually not feasible economically and strategically. And I think this is something that, uh, that, that, that we look at because, again, I think this is one of our interests here. In some of the discussion this morning, there was, uh, I think, the assumption that the motivations of the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and other uh, Arab Gulf states is at least misinterpreted or misunderstood in the Horn of Africa. Uh, and one of our speakers actually said, uh, we believe that the Emirates in particular means well, but needs to reach out. So how, how do you think that the Emirates is perceived? And uh, how would you like to be perceived? No, as, I, think, as I, think, I, think, I think in general, we are perceived very well. I mean, again, you have to really put things in perspective. This sort of polarization that the Middle East is living in is, is very much a polarization within a, a very politicized minority. Mm. But you have to accept that, in general, you, know, you can't come and, and see the view of a small minority who have their own mm. uh, political views and sort of consider that as a general view. I think anybody trading with the UAE uh, from the Somali uh, merchants, any company that does business with the UAE, any visitor that comes to the UAE, anybody dealing with us and knows us, uh, has a very positive view because our involvement there is basically an involvement that understands that this should be a win-win situation. If it's not a win-win situation, it's not tenable. There is no way that a, a, a win-lose situation will be acceptable by us or by any country in the world. So I would say to magnify the view of a very polarized minority, because we are going through a region in polarization. So these views, at the end of the day, are uh, reflective in many areas, not only in the world. But I think when you look at a wider picture and you ask the businessman and the travelers and the ordinary people, I think then you start putting things in perspective. You don't really look at, at it from a prism of a small 
a group of experts or a small group of politicized people. Having said that, I think, as always, as any country does, we need to communicate better. Are we communicating our objectives? I think we are. Are we doing a good job? I think overall, yes. Are we doing enough? No. I mean, you can never really do uh, enough communication. And I think any communication has to also be a mature communication. You know, you have to come and speak uh, in, in, in quite, I would say, a measured, mature uh, tone. In a sense, you have to come and say, we failed in this, we've succeeded in this, we consider this a challenge, we've done well here. Because again, I think this is an important part. So I would say that on the Horn of Africa in general, we do need more communication. We do need more, and if you look at it from a strategic view, <coughs> from a strategic view, it's very clear. There is an interconnectedness between the Horn and our region. The Horn prospers, we benefit. If the Horn doesn't prosper, we don't benefit, and in fact, it, has, it might have an, uh, a, neg a negative impact. Underneath that, we have an interest in addressing the issue of extremism and terrorism because this is an issue that is fluid and it's not, you know, it doesn't stop at a certain border. And we've clearly seen that in, in, in many cases. Underneath that, it is all about economic cooperation. It is about managing very high expectations. Because really, if you look at also some of the countries of the Horn, the, uh, their expectations should be managed in a sense. Mm -hmm. They have to expect that we are there as part of the international community to support them, but they also have to do a lot themselves in terms of governance, in terms of identifying mm -hmm. opportunity, in terms of ensuring ease of doing business, in terms of ensuring that the money that is coming there uh, is is not really coming into a corrupt system. I think that it, you need the track record. You know, people are going to come and do that one investment, and if that one investment is somehow, uh, you know, uh, obstructed by corruption, etc., you can be sure it will be orphaned. Mm -hmm. If that one investment actually is. Uh, is not, then you can expect a second one and a third one in many ways. Yeah. Well, one of the members of the audience complimented you on your speech, and particularly your reference to the need for greater multilateral discussion and action on the horn. Um, and I note that in your speech you talked about the African Union, you supported the Saudi Arabian idea of a Red Sea grouping, and then you put much of this in the context of the greater Indian Ocean. So. How do you and how did the Emirates view multilateral discussions and multilateral action with regard to uh, the Horn again, of Africa? Again, we are, you know, I like to think that we are a medium-sized country, mm. okay? So in many ways, I like to think that we are a team player. So in that sense, I don't think, I think it is futile for the United Arab Emirates to really think that it can have its own solo strategy in a country like uh, Ethiopia or Somalia or Sudan or any of these countries which are much more populous and you know very, very complicated uh, in terms of their own internal politics, etc. So I think from this perspective, we know what are our core strategic uh, objectives. It's stability, it's extremism, terrorism, and it's economic integration, opportunity, and so on and so forth. So we will actually come and be part of the team that does these things. And then within that team, we will actually be a discussant. You know, that team might be more geared this way, we might be geared that way, but we will always work within that team. I don't think that we have our own solo uh, strategy. It'll be futile, it'll be unrealistic, it'll be hubris in, in many ways. So I think this is more or less how we operate. Let me change gears a bit and talk a bit about the threats from the Horn of Africa, the threats to maritime security, 
um, the threat of terrorism. You discussed al-Shabaab, you discussed al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, how does this all fit together? How are you able to fit a post-war Yemen um, security concerns on the west of the uh, Arabian Sea uh, into a framework that provides the long-term security for the economy and investment uh, and <laughs> commerce that you want to see? I know this is a, an short, impossible question. The short uh, answer is with difficulty. <laughs> but again, but again I, I have to come back and say, why would a country our size think even of all these things? I think going back because of the nature of the international system, because we know the way the world is developing, you know, the sort of clear division of countries and interests that was there in a bipolar world are no longer there. So clearly, it's not something that we cherish, but I think we are a believer that to be relevant, you have to accept burden sharing. You know? So clearly, if you think that we can just rewind back to 1982 or 83 or 84 and let the big two countries take care of these things, it's a different world these two big countries, one of them doesn't exist anymore and has very little really interest in, you know, its successor state has very little interest in, uh, in Africa, mm -hmm. you know, Russia in this case, successor state of the Soviet Union. So I would say that uh, we, we have to be careful in terms of uh, taking these responsibilities. We have to accept that these responsibilities are part of a collective and accept that the goals of these responsibilities are basically, as I said, about stability, about fighting extremism, and about finding economic prosperity. I think if you put them under these strategic values, uh, objectives, and accept that you will be part of this team or that team, I think you can add value. But I don't think, as I said, it's the UAE really with its own solo uh, view. But we have to accept that. And I think from that perspective, of course, the, Sa the Saudi view of this Red Sea uh, you know, structure is very bold. It's not going to be easy. But at least what you are really seeing is a country on the Red Sea with huge you know, sort of coast on the Red Sea is trying to play an important regional role in finding stability and cooperation there. It's still very, I would say, uh, you know, early stage of this. But I think this is the sort of thinking that we want to see. A couple of the questions have to do very And from this perspective, please. sorry, yes. it, you know, Again, I think we are more with the idea that the construct itself is not only literal states, but a little bit beyond, because it has an impact. I might not have a presence on the Red Sea, but a stable Red Sea impacts my economy, impacts my security, and so on and so forth. And I think this is very important. But a couple of the questioners um, gave ideas and asked questions about where the Emirates believe you have a comparative advantage to make things turn out better in the Horn of Africa and potentially elsewhere using soft power as a leader of innovation in blockchain, cryptocurrency. Uh, Again, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it will be more competitive as more and more countries realize that their prosperity is in opening their economies and having uh, what I would call uh, effective governance, it means that more and more markets are going to boom. I mean, that is at least our... So clearly, we have also to be in tune with that. And I think from that perspective, we bring a local uh, success story. You know, we are not Singapore, which is a few thousand kilometers away. This is a success, a local success story, where a normal Somali trader coming to Dubai actually sees 
how we're managing this, how we're managing that. So clearly we are, you know, your neighborhood store in many ways. And I think from that, we need to work on two things. We need to try and bring uh, more uh, global expertise and localize it. And by bringing global expertise, localizing it, we become more relative, uh, yeah. relevant to our own region. I mean, again, you know, you can uh, always get uh, perhaps a very good German experience in how they manage their post, for example. Yeah. But if the UAE next door is managing its post well, I think it's more relevant to the region around it because it is actually a local experience. But clearly, uh, you know, we are, uh, you know, we are very much, you know, at the same time uh, cognizant that we are in a global race for competition. So we need to continuously improve. And, you know, we need to specialize in certain things. And I think these are some of the things that will be our forte. And as I mentioned, you know, this whole idea, you know, I mean, I've read like hundreds of stories about the UAE's crave for ports. But I think many of these stories miss the major, major component. And that is really business and logistics has, has been at the heart of our success story in the UAE. So I think it is only normal that we would ask for more airline mm -hmm. rights, that we would uh, try and manage more container ports, etc. You know, the, the whole idea of linking it to more of a political ambition, I think is, is, uh, is, is, is not really uh, on the money. I think the, the on the money part is that this is really what they've been doing for so many years, and it makes sense for them not to be, you know, squeezed out of this market or out of that region, because this is really what gives them a competitive advantage. And uh, the largest block of questions actually had to do with the five priorities with which you ended your speech, yeah. uh, with several people which asking I don't you to. Now. <laughs> I will. I will go through some of them from my notes to yeah. increase regional uh, yeah. multilateral yeah. cooperation, to uh, give yeah. regional organizations a bit more of a role in security, uh, to improve regional and state level governance, uh, to work more on counterterrorism, especially countering the funding to, for terrorist organizations. But, but uh, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, so for example. Is, can, I mean, can you, can you I mean, prioritize again, them or show? Uh, I, I want to just say something, for example, yes. about the effectiveness of the African Union. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to come and, uh, uh, you know, I have to come and congratulate the African Union for its success in Sudan, for its effectiveness in many uh, of the issues of the African continent. For right now, for example, fighting. Uh, actively to play a more important role in Libya, for example. And I have to say that this is an area where uh, we have not been as successful as the Arab League. And this is a discussion that actually is, I'm not going to say repeated, but it's quite often in the Arab League that we do have a model of a regional organization that has been active and being uh, active and relevant. And the Arab League has not been. Now, this is, I think, an area where the UAE would like to work, for example. This is where I say the effectiveness of regional organizations. And I don't think we've been successful there. Do we give up? No. We need to actually learn and understand and see. And, you know, again, the Arab League is much older institution than the African Union, but, but, but much less effective. And you get that from many of the Arab foreign ministers who are uh, from countries that are members of, of, of both organizations. So I would say these are the other areas. My main talk today has really been about trying to identify the strategic uh, connectedness, really, of the uh, Horn of Africa, extending it to Sudan, with our region. And I think this is the sort of thing that we need to look at. Because strategy without detail doesn't lead you anywhere. But if you've got a lot of detail without actually having a clear strategy, that also is, uh, is going to bring you to a lot of cul-de-sacs, Yanni. And I don't think that we want to do that there. Dr. Anwar, thank you very much for You're coming welcome. today. If you join me in thanking Dr. Thank Anwar for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.